Thank you all for coming out to Sustainable Claremont's 98th Dialogue. Yeah, almost a hundred. Um, so today we're going to be talking about plastics, pla packaging, recycling, um, from global to local. And so this is a really interesting talk, and I think just by looking at the numbers that we have in this room tonight, um, it's, a, it's a confusing topic, and I think we all want to know more. Um, and so here, hopefully tonight, we'll be able to answer some of those questions. Um, I'll introduce, or I'll have Freeman introduce Terry in just a moment here. We also have Krista Makula here from the City of Claremont's Community Services Department, um, who will be answering questions at the end. Um, and so if you have questions during the dialogue, please wait till the end, and then we'll kind of go around and we'll give you the mic so that when people are watching this after we, we post these dialogues online, that they'll be able to hear the questions. Um, so, so we'll go ahead and do that. Um, some quick uh, event reminders before we get started. This Saturday, we have a tree steward workshop. Um, we also have our national cleanup day. We'll be at cleaning up Wheeler Park. Um, on October 14th, we have our annual gala. And so if you'd like to buy tickets for that, uh, check out our website or sign up for our newsletter and you can follow the link uh, for that. We also have our plantings, our tree plantings coming up in October and November, and those dates are still to, de to be determined. Um, and again, if you just follow us on social or follow our newsletter, we'll be able to get those dates to you. Um, this is a dialogue that we've been planning for a couple months now, and it's one that I've been really excited about since I first met Terry. Um, so I'm super excited for tonight. Uh, I think after tonight we'll all feel a little bit more hopeful and a little bit more frustrated, but definitely a little bit, you know, definitely more educated. Um, and so, so a good uh, outcome for these types of dialogues. Uh, I'm going to hand the mic over to Freeman, Alan, who's going to introduce Terry for us. Thank you. Terry is a very special person. She was involved in the formation of Sustainable Claremont, what was it, about 10 years ago? And this is the third time she'll be presenting one of these dialogues. Her first one was in March 7th, 2011, when she was talking about Toward Zero Waste, and she spoke together with Bowen Close from Pomona College, and it was a general subject that uh, uh, led to all kinds of interesting things. That was sustainability dialogue number 15. Then more recently, in 2016, uh, on May, uh, she spoke on the Claremont Hills Wilderness Park Master Plan. That's the time when the city of Claremont was uh, formulating the plan and was going through the city council. And uh, now Terry, I believe, is president of the Wilderness Park uh, organization. Uh, so she has a huge background in sustainability. She's been working with Sealed Air Corporation for all these years, and now I think she's director of sustainability and has gone from primarily speaking to people like this to lobbying and doing a number of other things. I hope I got that right. Yeah, you do. Right. So I think I'll turn it over to Terry to tell us how to deal with plastics. And boy, do I have a lot of questions. <laughs> and so do I. Thank you, Freeman. Thank it you. really is a pleasure to be here. I have to say that I'm in an age where I could be retired. And I have chosen not to be retired because the job I do for Sealed Air Corporation is the job I would do as a volunteer. But I have the benefits of getting paid for it. <laughs> so I want to be really clear. I work for a plastics company. And I think it's really good. And I think it's a super sustainable corporation. And I'm not here to talk about sealed air, but I am here to talk about plastics. And some of the efforts that are going on with plastics corporations around the world to create a circular economy. And I also want to talk about really basic information about plastics about resin identification codes, about recycling, about what's happening on a global basis, and then most importantly, what can we do as individuals in Claremont if we want to make a difference? And I'm going to guess that you're here because you've already made a personal commitment at some level to living a more sustainable life. 
And I will say that there is no right way. All of us need to consider the pros and cons of every decision we make and then make the choice that's right for us without judgment for how other people choose to do the same. So I'm going to talk first about what's plastic. I mean, if plastic were simple, then we would be able to have a very simple solution, but it's not simple. The source, the history, why it's used, how it's used, and the benefits. I also want to talk about the resin identification codes. And these are the codes that are numbers one through seven, and you see them on various materials, especially rigid containers. And they have a particular purpose, but I would say there are as many definitions that are, necess that are not necessarily true as there are numbers one through seven. <laughs> then I want to talk about recycling because I remember when I was in, in high school, the beginning of recycling and how important it was to participate in recycling. And the world of recycling was quite different then. We were recycling newspaper, aluminum, and glass. And all the people that invested in recycling businesses at that time put in equipment and technology to recycle newspaper, aluminum, and glass. We're not recycling those very much anymore. But the profitability of recyclers is very low. So they don't have the wherewithal necessarily to invest in capital that allow them to recycle the multiplicity of high performance materials that they're getting sent to them in our blue bin. So I want to talk about that and then some of the most recent developments with respect to the way we used to recycle and the way we're recycling today without China as the repository for the majority of materials that we generate. And then plastic in the ocean. Can somebody raise their hand if you have not seen headlines or pictures of turtles with straws in their noses, or birds with their guts full of plastic, or mammals with their fins caught in fishing nets. Anyone has not seen pictures that are horrifying about plastic in the ocean? I think we've all been emotionally affected by images of what's going on in our ocean, and we have to do something about it. Finally, and I've, as Freeman mentioned, I've just recently become involved in legislation and working with legislators to help them understand the realities of how we can control plastic and creating a, a circular economy in a political environment that wants very simple answers. Finally, I'll talk about Claremont. And Kristen is here to help. So if we have questions, she can give us the answers. Or she says if she doesn't know the answers, she'll get back to us. So I'm very grateful to have a helper here. And finally, the consequences of the decisions we make. In my opinion, a lot of what's important when we're coming down to really making a decision is about food security as we have a growing population and increasing food insecurity, and we have greenhouse gas emissions that are continuing to raise the heat in our environment and the potential impact of rising oceans, et cetera, let's be sure that when we're coming up with a solution for how to recycle plastic, we're not inadvertently raising greenhouse gas emissions and causing the net negative impact on our world. So let's get started. First of all, plastic. It's a polymer. And it's a polymer of repeating monomers. That's about as much chemistry as I'm going to get into. What's that thing down below? Don't ask me. It's some plastic that I picked up off the internet. <laughs> but someone in here might know what it is. Um, so this plastic material can be extruded, it can be molded, it can be thermoformed into a variety of shapes. And 
I, for a long time, was very happy to be using a recycled Patagonia fiber fleece. Now I'm concerned about microfiber in my washing machine and going into the ocean. But it can be made into fibers that are made into clothing or fibers that are made into carpet. There are natural polymers. And we used to use those for things like guitar picks or you know, amber, or tortoiseshell. Those are all naturally occurring polymers. And then in 1862, we started creating synthetic polymers. And you can see that there's a history of us creating polymers that serve humanity for very specific purposes. The developments accelerated with war. So in World War I, um, we, tend, we started moving our source of fuel from coal to oil. And that allowed us to substitute wood glass with plastic materials. World War II, after World War II, during World War II, an even greater number of different plastics evolved. So in the 1960s, I think before 1960, we didn't have this sense of consumerism. But in the 1960s, things changed. And we started being a much more consumer-driven society. And much of that had to do with the inexpensive nature and very available plastics that made it very easy for people to have a variety of, of nice things that they wanted. In the 1970s, I mean, you can see a very old computer and a new laptop. You can see plastics really had a lot uh, had a big role to play in terms of high technology and a huge role to play in the safety of medicine. I don't know about you, but I really wouldn't want to go back to the days of sterilizing syringes that are used for multiple people or having surgery with tools that are not disposable and that need to be autoclaved. So for, from my perspective, the plastics have been a big benefit for the medical industry. They've created lightweight cars, a variety of other things. So plastic comes from a variety of sources. It comes from coal, crude oil. It comes from natural gas. And there's a process that is done. Most, a lot of the companies in the United States are along the um, Gulf Coast. And they process this into a variety of materials. So you can see here all the different materials that end up as a result of crude oil being heated, putting into distillation columns. And you can see different carbon um, levels and then these different kinds of materials. And the interesting thing, the reason that I have this up here, is that many of these processes can be reversed. So think about being able to create a polymer, a plastic that has a use, and then reversing it turning it back into the monomers that it started with and recycling them all over again. And that's been possible since the very beginning when this process was first invented. Why haven't we done it? No economic reason. It's cheaper to just continue to make virgin materials. So Monomers are polymerized into long chains, and then they're, they, they're done in the presence of other materials. And depending on the other materials that are included in that process, they become different types of plastics. In addition to that, they're additives. And we've all heard about BPA and other additives that are not such good actors, but they're other additives that make the plastic flow nicely give it the characteristics that are necessary to perform the way we want it to perform. And in the case of food, the packaging that is used for food, all of the additives are reviewed by the FDA to be sure that they're safe and they don't leach into the food. So there, all that to say there are a huge variety of plastics. One of the reasons that there is no simple solution to how do you recycle or what do you do at the end of life. And all of these plastics have been developed to perform specific functions for specific purposes to benefit us and us as consumers. So let's talk about a few of them. Um, 
PET. That it, it can look like this. It can look like this. But PET has a special property of having both a moisture barrier and a gas barrier. So if you want a carbonated beverage, you want to put it in PT because that can keep the carbon in and keep it fizzy so when you open it, it fizzes. Or if you have a soda stream like I do to try to be more sustainable, it's one heck of a robust piece of plastic to keep that carbonation in place. Or you can have trays that are heatable in the oven, in the microwave for convenience foods. A different type of plastic, HDPE, is different in the sense that, it, yes, it is, has a moisture barrier, but it's very resistant to chemicals. And so you'll find it with detergents or shampoos or um, various chemicals will be stored in that particular material. And you can't find one plastic that's going to do all of those things. So this is an extreme example, I would say, and that is you take these rigid plastics and let's say you want them to perform to preserve food. And you want to do it with the smallest, lightest weight packaging possible because we want to be as sustainable as possible. We don't want to ship a lot of packaging around the world. So these films that are used for things like meat, poultry, cheese, generally range from 1 to 3.5 mils in thickness. So just for a frame of reference, a human hair is about 4 mils. These are really thin, high-performance films. And they're not just monolayers. They're not just one type of plastic. So in many cases, you have a huge variety of materials, all serving a different purpose. There are times when these are up to 30 different layers and still only a thickness of less than a human hair. High performance, lightweight film. So I will say, when I think about plastic packaging, I think about the plastic, but more importantly, I think about the whole supply chain. So let's use the most extreme example of beef. And we know that when they eat grass, and some people call it burping, um, they emit methane, which is a huge impact on the environment. They also eat a lot of grass. The conversion ratio of how much they eat to how many pounds of protein we actually eat is not very efficient, not compared to poultry, for instance. But it's really important that if we grow beef for food, and we always will, and there are cultures in the, United, in the world where beef is the only protein that is going to be acceptable to that culture, we'd better be sure that we preserve every bit of energy and resources that went into producing that beef. <coughs> From processing, packaging, through distribution, through retail, through food service, and to the consumer, let's be sure that the packaging that's being used does not reduce the shelf life or does not reduce the quality or the ability of that product to make it to market or to feed people that are hungry. So when you're considering it, you want to look at energy, packaging, transportation, and food waste. And all those things need to be considered when you're talking about packaging. If the right film, and now I really am just talking about these high-performance films, when the right film is selected, it extends shelf life. So in a world where more and more people are moving to cities, and more and more food is being grown away from those cities, and we're needing to transport it from the farm or the processor to the people that are hungry, there's, there's a greater need for shelf life. And that means that you can process it, you can ship it, you can distribute it, and you as a consumer can bring it home and have it be high quality, fresh, safe, for a longer period of time than it would be otherwise. For instance, if, if I were, let's say I go to the corner butcher and I buy, let's say, a roast. And it's wrapped in butcher paper and I take it home to my refrigerator and I, I have two days to use it while it's still at premium quality and safety. But let's say 
Charlene and Mike say, let's go dancing, and I'd rather go ballroom dancing than fix that roast, <laughs> I have to think twice because I only have two days to eat that roast. If I have a package that gives me 21 days, then I have a lot more freedom. That's just selfishly speaking. But there's some pretty impressive differences in days. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. There we go. So the other thing, most people are really concerned about packaging. Packaging is bad, right? We don't want to use plastic. We want everything to be fresh, unpackaged. But if we focus just on that, we may be sacrificing the carbon footprint and the resources that went into the product itself. So I would ask you, this is my first ask, when you're considering making a decision, consider not only the packaging that you're seeing and whether you're going to be able to recycle or not, but consider the product itself. What are the resources that went into making that product, whether it's a laptop or food or something else, and be sure that you're making a decision about what will protect that effectively so that you are really protecting the resources that went into that. So if I'm thinking of a computer, like a laptop, it's often about 90 to 1 ratio. of uh, the, the packaging that goes in to protect a computer sent through e-commerce versus the resources used to, to create that computer, it's about a 90 to 1 ratio. So do you really want to sacrifice for a more recyclable package if you're going to end up with more damage? The other thing that I like to consider is transportation. So one of the big emitters in our environment is fuel used to transport products. So I would say another ask, when you're thinking about buying something, buy the smallest version of it that has been able to be more efficiently transported in a truck or in a UPS van or wherever the transportation is because the more that truck can hold as it travels those miles and burns that diesel, the more efficient it is and the more effective use of that diesel is being used for distributing products. And this is just a comparison of if you wanted to ship 10 gallons of beverages, even though we might say today aluminum is a lot more recyclable today than plastic, you're also going to be transporting more weight via diesel. So there's an organization that was formed about 12 or 15 years ago called the Sustainable Packaging Coalition. So this is a group of manufacturers, brand owners, retailers, technology people that came together to try to figure out what is a sustainable package. And this is what they came up with. And what you can see is it's not all just about the material. It's about how it's made using renewable energy. It's about its safety throughout the life of that material. And it's about optimization of the material itself and the, and the protection. And finally, that it's recovered and utilized effectively. We're all dealing, whether we're in the Sustainable Packaging Coalition or we're someone at home trying to figure out what am I supposed to do with this bag? We're all looking for that code. So what does that code mean? Well, the code was put into place because recyclers bail like materials and they sell them on the market and they want to be able to identify the material that they're sorting into a bale. So all it is is a resin identification code. It's purely established to identify the majority resin. So these are the seven codes. This does not mean that this has been recycled seven times. <laughs> so all of these codes identify particular types of plastic. 
The American Society of Plastics is the organization that established these resin codes for a very selfish reason to help the plastics industry. It doesn't indicate recycled content. It doesn't indicate recyclability. It's purely a voluntary identification code. But since everyone was so confused and a lot of people thought it was a recycling code, the ASTM has changed the recommendation. So as you look on your rigid containers or other materials, you're going to stop seeing chasing arrows, which to many people think means recycling, to a solid triangle trying to say to the general public, this isn't a recycling code. This is just a resin code. It's just a triangle with a number in it, and it has little initials that talk about what resin it is. So you should be seeing that. And when you do see the chasing arrows, voluntarily you may see people that are putting in a percentage to indicate the percentage of recycled content or the recyclability. But what I think is better is this. So this is a label that was designed by the Sustainable Packaging Coalition. And I remember being at the EPA about 10 years ago talking about different pictures and images that would resonate with consumers to try to help them figure out how to recycle. And so this is what we came up with. And what it is is a label to instruct consumers. So it tells you, first of all, what do you need to do? Well, you empty it so there's no food or water in it, and then you put the cap back on. Why the cap? Because if this gets smashed when it's going th in the truck being sent to the municipal sorting facility, it will most likely remain flat and it'll sort with paper. If the cap is on, it's likely to stay in a three-dimensional structure. And when this flows down the conveyor and a near-infrared camera looks at it and says, oh, that's PET, a little blast of air is going to pop that into a bin and it's going to end up with the other PET bottles. Or, if it's not so sophisticated, there will be humans picking up bottles that have necks on them and putting them into a bin next to them. Depends on how sophisticated the system is. It also says you can go to the website at howtorecycle.info to get more information. It'll, t oops. It'll tell you, in this case, it means widely recycled. It's a plastic bottle. So there are four different labels. And you can see there's widely recycled. And what that means is that 60% of Americans have access to curbside or local recycling of that particular resin or that particular shape. That's Federal Trade Commission Green Guides. Anyone who doesn't abide by that is seen to be deceiving consumers. And the most interesting case right now is Keurig. So how many of you have had coffee with Keurig pods? There you go. So Keurig was very sensitive to the perception of their Keurig pods by the public, especially the public that was concerned about sustainability. So they selected a particular resin for their pods that they thought would be recyclable. And in fact, they tested it with the American Recycling, let's see, Recycling Association, no, oh, Association of Plastic Recyclers. They have a whole protocol for how to test various forms of plastic. They tested it, it passed. They therefore felt that they were um, correct in claiming that these pods were recyclable. They did a lot more than many companies do by doing this testing. They're now being sued. Why? Because most municipal sorting facilities have grids that are part of their conveyor system that sort materials. Those grids are larger. They're about three inches by three inches. And the Keurig pods fall through. They don't get recycled. And because 60% of the American population does not have access to recycling facilities with grids that are smaller than three by three, the Federal Trade Commission has ruled that it was deceptive, a deceptive claim. 
even though they tried very hard to do the right thing. Um, if it's not uh, if it's not widely recycled, but it sometimes is and sometimes isn't, for instance, a PET tray like this, depending on where you live, it may or may not be this particular, yeah, this is PET, this is resin code identification code one, it may or may not be recycled in your community. So you'd need to check with Kristen and decide whether you can put this in your recycling bin or not. And everywhere in the country, people need to check. If it's not yet recycled, then it gets that label. And if it's a film like this, it can go into store drop-off. How many people have been to a store that has bins out in front where you can put your film? So you, you know what they are, Lowe's, all the grocery stores. But I'll tell you what, if you go to a store that has decided that they're getting way too much trash in those bins and it's causing a big problem for their staff, which it is, just go to the checker and say, can you please recycle this, this bag of film with your recycling in the back? And most stores will say, oh, of course, I'll take that and I'll take it back because they recycle all the stretch film that they get wrapped around their pallets when they're receiving materials to restock their shelf. That's called store drop-off. So here's how it's used in practice. And maybe you've seen this, but here's a container of water bottles. And what this label is saying is the plastic film on the outside, take it to store drop-off. The paper tray that the bottles are sitting in, that's widely recycled. And be sure to empty and replace, uh, be sure to empty the bottle, replace the cap, and put it in your bin, and it's widely recycled. But in the case of this one, it's a very different message, but you can see that each part of that package has instructions for what you should do. And here's a pouch that says, recycle if clean and, if clean and dry, take it to store drop off. So look for these, they're becoming more and more prevalent. Walmart, Target, Kroger are all demanding that they be used. Walmart for their private label products, Kroger and others for all the products that they carry. So this is going to become a much more prevalent label and I think much more successful in getting consumers to know what to do. Why do we need store drop-off? So how many people have been to a municipal sorting facility? Oh yeah, so there are a number of people. It's pretty impressive and pretty surprisingly simple. This conveyor is the heart of this recycling system. And a conveyor with people standing on each side pulling materials out, generally speaking. And one of the things that happens is the material ends up going up a chain of gears as part of the sorting process. And those gears, if there are things like film, textiles, hoses, wire, get caught, and this is really a picture of just a few hours of running at a municipal sorting facility. Imagine if this is your business, and every hour or two, and by the way, these are usually on an angle going up, you need to send four or five people with either blow torches or big knives to cut this stuff out of the gears to keep your operation running. So maybe the third ask is please don't put anything linear or film-like into your blue bin because it really causes serious problems for our recyclers. No wish cycling. So this is the Association of Plastics Recyclers. They're the go-to organization for what gets recycled in the United States. And this standard that they set is the worldwide standard as well. So when I talk with my associates in Italy or my associate, associates in the UK and I ask them for their standards, they go, oh, we all go by APR. 60% of consumers or communities have to have access to recycling that shape and that material. It has to sort correctly. That means it has to be recognized by near infrared and be able to be pushed into the right bin. Well, one of the interesting things is near infrared doesn't recognize black. 
So let's say this tray, this meat tray, was black. It wouldn't be picked up by near-infrared, so they wouldn't know what to do with it. So black is not recyclable, no matter what the resin code says. And then they say it has to be further processed, and that's where things get really interesting. So because this 60% was such a big deal, the Sustainable Packaging Coalition did a study across the United States to figure out which shapes, which resin codes are uh, um, available to consumers. And sure enough, there are all these different materials, 60% or greater. So this was in 2015, 2016. And I don't know about you, but I was pretty, pretty much putting everything into the recycling bin at that point. Yeah. Because I had visited our MRF, and the guy that was running it, whose name I don't remember, said, just put it in. Let me decide what I can sell and not sell. And I said, oh, that's great with me. It makes me feel less guilty. I'll put everything in until we got to the drought. And then I had the, the calculus of, oh, I want to recycle this, but it has to be clean. Should I use water to clean it to recycle the plastic or save the water because we're in a drought? <laughs> so my occasional answer was, if I have a used paper towel that I've already used, and it's in the trash, I can take it out, wipe out the tray, put the tray in the recycling bin, put the towel back in the trash, and hope that it's clean enough. But I didn't want to use water. Well, it's easy now because, generally speaking, there's not much we can recycle at the moment. Everything changed. So at that time, most of what we recycled was going into these big containers that you see in San Pedro and Long Beach and was being sent to China. And China was basically doing our recycling for us. Not just the United States, everyone in the world was sending their trash to China and getting paid for it. It was pretty lucrative to bail pretty much, it's mostly PET, it's mostly polypropylene, we'll get paid for it, China will take it, we'll call it recycling and everyone feels good. But in 2018, 2017, 2018, China said, enough. We have our own economy that now is a consumer economy. We have our own plastic packaging and paper and aluminum and glass that we're dealing with. And by the way, we want it pure. So yes, we'll take your materials. It just needs to be 99.5% pure. And if you think about those MRFs, with those conveyors, with everything in it, that's next to impossible. So basically, no more recycling through China. So what's happening in California? Our, recycling, our recyclers are going out of business. They're being forced to take our materials, and there's nowhere to sell them. And we're expecting them to continue to stay in business. We operate in a capitalistic economy. We are not subsidizing these people. They have a product that they're trying to sell, and the product is not high quality enough to get paid. They can't stay in business. So my, sec my fifth ask is, let's reconsider the end of life. This is an opportunity to like rethink the whole thing. So here are the options as I see them. We can send things to landfill. For the most part, things don't degrade there. Even food, because of the way those are managed, they generally aren't breaking food down or much of anything else. And if they're properly managed, they're not leaching anything into the groundwater. It's just a pile of resource that we don't know what to do with right now. What if instead of feeling guilty, this could be my own personal rationalization, but I'll share it with you in case someone else likes it. When I put it into landfill, I'm not just throwing it away. I'm just putting it in a repository for the use of future generations when they go to mine our landfills. <laughs> but if you don't like that explanation, there are some others. So another option is biological recovery. So that's managed composting. So that's composting that's done really well without emissions, 
um, and done so that it's hot enough that the, the microbes are breaking down the materials and the output is a compost that can be added to the land to add organics back into soil to make it more nutritious. We have a problem in Los Angeles because of AQMD and the fear about um, changes in atmosphere due to emissions, methane, and other greenhouse gases from composting. Mechanical recycling is what we all just saw. It's those conveyors with the gears and the people. And what happens at the other end is that by and large, those materials are ground up or melted and reused again. So they are very simply processed. They're not breaking it down into monomers. They're just taking PET or polypropylene or other materials, grinding it up, extruding it, turning it into resin, and selling it to someone that will take that quality of material. And since the starting material of the recycling facility is fairly dirty, the output that they're selling is not terribly desirable. And so the grade of resin that can be purchased from mechanical recycling is pretty low. The next one is feedstock recycling. Remember I talked about how plastic is made through um, the cracking process of petroleum, crude oil, coal, et cetera, natural gas. This is basically a reversal of that. So you're basically taking those polymers and breaking them back down into monomers. And they become as pure as they were at the beginning, and they can be food grade. They can be repolymerized into whatever needs to be repolymerized as a method of recycling. And finally, energy recovery. We can use that to generate electricity. Generally, it's through incineration. There are other methods. These days, the technology for that is clean. And there are certain industries, like the cement industry, that's very energy um, demanding that is happy to use some of our waste to generate energy for them to create cement. But now, given the situation that we are responsible for our own waste, it's important that we become broad-minded about what options we should consider as being reasonable and establishing a circular economy. So today, I'll go back to just plastic. Today, it's very linear. Today we make it, we use it, we dispose of it. And it, if we really want a circular economy, there's several different ways we can get there. One is up to all of us, is reuse it. So if you have an opportunity to say buy a detergent or some material that, or some like shampoo or something that can be refilled, that's great, reuse, reuse, reuse. Or if you get bubble wrap or mailers, don't just throw them away or hope they can be recycled. Use them again and again. Then there's mechanical recycling. That's what I just talked about. It's really important that we pay attention to what can be mechanically recycled today in Claremont. And finally, chemical recycling, this process of pyrolysis or distillation or other methodologies of taking polymers and breaking them down into monomers. And this is a little aside. Has anybody seen packages that say, this is biodegradable, you, it just needs to be out in the sun, or it needs to be? Well, I would say, and most people in the industry say, that this is very irresponsible. The concept is that these oxo-degradables or UV-degradable materials will cause the plastic to break down much more quickly into smaller pieces, and that then microbes are able to digest it and create basically carbon and oxygen. But it doesn't happen in the time frame that is considered to be appropriate for breakdown. It's not at the same rate as food. And what it does is remove that material from a circular economy. So if it has these additives in it, then we don't, I don't want it in my plastic package. And so it, it takes it out of the opportunity to be 
part of the circular economy for plastics. So if people talk about this, I, the only country in the world I know right now that is demanding oxidegradable is Saudi Arabia. Everywhere else is saying, no, we don't want it. So what we really want to do is, as a consumer, you want to think about when you make a purchase, are, is this packaging designed to protect the product? Is the packaging optimizing resources as much as possible? So am I buying wine from a wine distributor that uses a big box and a whole lot of peanuts, or am I buying it from one that uses fiber, well-formed, protective little sections for the wine bottles, or some other methodology, but each person has to look at their own preferred food item or their own preferred item and choose for themselves whether they think that their supplier is using packaging that is as efficient as possible and still providing protection. Finally, packaging that's made from sustainable materials and preferentially packaging that's being sold by companies that are being responsible in terms of using recycled content and making their products as recyclable as possible. So we all know there's this war on plastics and turtles with straws in their noses and um, horrible images of birds dying from stomachs full of plastic. And a lot of the ocean contamination is contained in these gyres. And of course, we're on the Pacific coast, so we hear about the Pacific gyre, but there are gyres all over the world that contain very large amounts of plastic. And the knee-jerk reaction for those of us that have the opportunity to choose is to say, let's just not use plastics. There are grocery stores in the UK that, have, that say, come shop here, we have no plastics in our store. We're helping to solve the ocean plastic problem. But before we jump to a solution, I think it's important to figure out the source of the problem. So there have been several studies. The one that I think is very responsible is the Ocean Conservancy. And whoops, this is us. This is the LA River. So we do have a problem. So I, I just didn't want to say we don't have a problem here. We do. And we certainly have a responsibility to be sure that the trash from fast food does not blow on the wind into the drain and then out into the LA River. But the majority of the problem comes from other places. 10 rivers in the world are, the, are responsible for 80%, 80 to 89%, depending on whose study it is, for the plastic in the ocean. Why? Because the communities, the people that live in these locations are moving very rapidly from subsistence living to a middle class. And they want the goodies we have. And if you are a woman who's responsible for doing the laundry of your family and you can't afford to buy a huge container of laundry soap, but you can buy a little sachet for a few pennies that allows you to do the laundry in the river, then that's what you do. And if no one picks up your trash, there's no infrastructure for collection, trash collection and you don't want trash in front of your house, if you live on a river, I'll tell you what, the best way to get rid of that is put it in the river and it will flow down to someone else. And your yard looks great. Mm -hmm. Or you throw it in a canyon. And as soon as there's a flash flood or a rainstorm, that canyon washes all of that material to the nearest river and out to the ocean. So what do we do? What we really need to do is help support projects to develop infrastructure in these countries. And there is a group called the Alliance to End Plastic Waste that is investing millions of dollars in these locations to start developing municipal sorting facilities and trash pickup. But I'll tell you, I think the most impressive solution is change the financial dynamics. So let's say you, most trash pickers in India are women, and they're usually women of a lower caste. And they often live at the trash dump with their families, and they sort through the trash, picking out the things they can sell. 
Right now, it's aluminum, glass, paper. What if we change that dynamic? What if the woman I know in Salt Lake City, who's a brilliant chemist and has developed little pyrolysis machines, is actually successful in her first trial of setting up a solar-powered pyrolysis machine on the Ganges, and she pays these women based on how many pounds of plastic they deliver to the facility. And that plastic, through the process of pyrolysis, gets turned into diesel fuel that's sold to the trucks and cars that operate in that village. And those women get paid on the basis of the ratio of what they brought. So when she presented that idea, they said, absolutely. But we don't want 100% of the income to come back to us. Please put aside 10% for a school so that our children don't have to be trash pickers when they grow up. And by the way, we want another 5% of the income that's generated to go into a fund so you can have enough money to please put a facility like this upstream. And she, she's put this into place in January, February, and we'll be able to get feedback on how it's worked. Mm. But if you change the financial dynamics and you make plastic waste valuable, like we really, how many aluminum cans do we see by the side of the road these days? Mm. All it takes is a few pennies and it changes the entire structure. So what happened is China put in a national sword and then most countries in the world started putting in regulations. One of the organizations that, put, that is lobbying on behalf of getting plastic out of the ocean is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So, so we've been part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation since the beginning. Ellen MacArthur was a woman who sailed around the world single-handedly. And when she got back to the UK, she decided to commit her life to making sure that the ocean was cared for. And she and the organization developed um, many things to care for the ocean, but one of them was setting up a new way of thinking about plastics. And she set up the circular economy for plastics and sought input from experts in the industry, and we participated. Then last year, about 400 companies and cities signed an agreement that we would strive to get rid of all unnecessary plastic, that we would create plastics that would be 100% recyclable by 2025 or compostable or reusable, and that we would use a high percentage of post-consumer recycle content. And when you think about 400 big companies that are making that sort of a pledge, you can guess that you're going to start seeing some action that's going to result in a much more sustainable economy for plastic. So I thought you'd be interested in who's signed on. Um, this is a report from earlier this year, and I would venture to say that if you went to this website and you looked a year, um, six months from now when they publish the next report, you'll find that more companies are included. But what you're seeing here are the top companies in each of these sectors, and the companies that are highlighted are those that have signed the agreement. So one of the things that you can do as a consumer is be aware of which companies are making these sorts of commitments and preferentially buy from them. The other thing that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and some of these regulations have put into place is a definition of single-use plastics. So single-use plastics has become the bad actor in the plastics world, and generally it's defined in Europe as being the items that you see in that chart on the left. So Europe says it's balloon sticks, cutlery, cotton swabs. Those are banned. Drink bottles are allowed only if the caps remain. So the Europeans have been very careful about how they define these, but all in all trying to reduce plastics waste. There are several plastic packaging items that I would say are not unnecessary and should be included as uh, exempt from single-use plastics because they perform a, a job that's more important in terms of protection, 
quality shelf life than things like a cotton swab. And those, while they may be only used once, that they have a different and necessary performance, including medical packaging. So what's really driving sustainability is protecting products. That's the most important thing. And then the secondary thing is resourcing or sourcing the material from post-consumer or recycled content and having it be recyclable. And that creates a circularity. There are a wide variety of organizations working on this, so if you're ever interested in learning more about it, these organizations are heavily invested in making this successful. So what can we do as individuals? Well, some of it's pretty obvious. Bring your own containers. Um, choose products that are, de are designed to use minimal amount of packaging. Consider protection of the product, not just the package itself. Recycle uh, what you can. Purchase products that have high percentages of post-consumer recycle content. So pay attention to the use of recycled content because if you're going to have a circular economy, there's only half of it is, is it recyclable. The other half is, is the output being purchased because we already know that if there is no market for the output, the recyclers will go out of business. So the companies that are, pro are committing to buy resin and use it are those that you want to support. So choose plastic that can be recycled in Claremont. Oh boy, that's a tough one. So I went to the County of Los Angeles, tried to figure out what was recyclable in the County of Los Angeles, and they said basically resin code one, resin code two with a neck on it. So it's like just the water bottle this, or a milk bottle. And I was hoping for a different answer, so I called Claremont, because I can put in my zip code, and LA County will come up with a phone number of our office, and I asked what we could do. And so we have our own set of guidelines in Claremont. Uh, and so we have a dirty dozen that changes on a regular basis, because our recycler waste management is constantly dealing with a dynamic and volatile market for their end products. And they can't always take what we wish they could take. So let me go. I'm going to ask Kristen a few things. It's brown. It's brown, and it is number five, polypropylene. No. This is really good at preserving arugula for longer than the bag, by the way. Um, but this is PET. It doesn't have a lid. Store drop off. Store drop off, yeah. Bubble, store drop off. Oh, my favorite. My cheese sticks. The container they came in? So it's a dilemma. Store drop off. If you can see that um, logo that says, how to recycle.info, you'll get information on that. So the final part of my talk, and this will be brief, because I think I'm running out of time, um, because we want to have time for discussion, is legislation. So what I will ask of you is, in addition to making choices to support the companies that are doing the right thing, and products that use post-consumer recycled content, and products that can be recycled, is pay attention to legislation that's happening in California. So these two bills, there are two bills, SB 54 and AB 1080, that are companion bills that were just considered in the legislative session that closed on Friday. And the intent is wonderful. The intent is to have a comprehensive program in California to have recycling be basically encouraged to the extent that if a company, a producer like Sealed Air, does not have the ability to recycle our products by 2024 at a rate of 20%, we cannot sell into the state of California. If we're not at 40% by 2028, can't sell. 75% by 2030. And so that means, let's say that the mechanical recycling infrastructure is the only thing that exists in 2028, 
and this can't go through it. No more string cheese. What are we going to do? We're going to buy cheese at the cheese cave, but not everybody has a cheese cave. Unintended consequences. And the problems are two. One is that in the 1980s, California passed legislation that banned distillation, pyrolysis, and several other methods of processing plastic. Those laws are still in the books. And so when I talk about chemical recycling being a way to take care of all of these complex and what I would say are necessary packaging, because statutes are on the books right now, the only acceptable definition of recycling is mechanical recycling. So as we consider legislation, we have to be thoughtful about accepting technologies that are new and in the end will solve the problem. And we're going to have to be able to thoughtfully lobby our legislators and explain to them the complexities of some of these issues that are very difficult to understand for somebody that's not a chemist to a, to a group of voters who want simple answers like ban plastics. And the unintended consequences is that we could end up with increased food waste, increased greenhouse gas emissions from methane to, to um, decomposing food, reduced insecuri uh, food security in California, and a significant impact on a lot of the businesses, retailers, et cetera, in California, not to mention the convenience of having string cheese as a snack. <laughs> so this is an, uh, an interesting uh, view from a website, Mary's Chicken. How many know Pittman Farms, Mary's Chicken, Organic Chicken? It's a really nice business in Central California. They made a commitment not to use expanded polystyrene trays. And so they now put their organic air-chilled chicken into these little plastic pockets with a lid on the top, and it preserves it, and it gives it long shelf life, and it's high quality. And this is the most or, uh, sustainable packaging they've been able to find, and this would be banned. The strawberries that are protected when these clamshells from damage and fungus that occurs when strawberries get crushed, banned. The convenience of pasta, I don't know if cellophane is recyclable. I, do you know? No, it's not. So that'd be banned. Well, and of course, ching, string cheese. So all that to say, there is no easy answer. We're all dealing with a dialogue at every level, in our own heads, when we're making consumer decisions, when we're talking with each other about what we're doing personally, and then a dialogue with our legislators, a dialogue with people that understand technology. And I hope that this is just the beginning of a dialogue with those of us that are trying to make a difference on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. I, I have to admit my perspective has changed greatly during this talk. Uh, now's the time for questions you have. Uh, in order to be sure we have it loud enough so it be properly recorded, I ask that you use the microphone, and Stuart's going to take the microphone away. Okay, I'm going to kind of guess who had their hand up first, so be patient. There we go. I have, that was great by the way, it really clarified a lot of issues, at least for me. I have two questions um, about the actual recycling. Um, are aluminum and tin cans recyclable? And what about the ones that have the paper labels? We've been slitting the paper labels off, and the same with the plastic bottles, slitting the labels off. Kristen. Yes, aluminum and tin are both recyclable. Um, we would ask that you remove the paper label, and I know that's an extra step to go to. They also need to be clean, so the tuna fish has to be fully removed and cleaned out. Um, separating materials is something that we're trying to educate the public about more. So even envelopes that you receive at your home, they want you to remove the film window, throw that in the trash, and recycle the paper. So it's a good question. 
definitely getting a lot more strict. This is a Prime, uh, Amazon Prime bag, and it does have the How to Recycle label on it, but it says, remove paper label before recycling. Yeah. So, <laughs> which is not easy. Um, but the, f first of all, the, the pyrolysis uh, suggestion seemed like a, a really neat solution to the whole, to a large part of the problem, maybe. And, and that really got my attention. I wasn't aware of that. Um, that's something brand new. And then, and then you touched on, you're talking to legislatures. And I said, oh my God. Because legislatures, as, as you alluded to, have a tendency to go off half-cocked with knee-jerk solutions that they think are going to solve a problem, and they only end up creating more problems than they were trying to solve to begin with. And that makes me really nervous. And I'm, I'm hoping all those agencies that were up there are trying to lobby them and inform them and say, don't do something stupid. Let's just do it a smart way once we get that smart way figured out. And the pyrolysis seems like a really neat solution. And it's, it's working in India, right? So I mean, I mean, if they can do it, we can do it. Yeah, I agree. And Freeman asked if my job has changed. <laughs> And I would say yes, because now lobbying is so much more important. And, and I would say not so much lobbying as educating. And it's, it is a big job. And there are more and more people being activated to be thoughtful about educating legislators. And there's a big difference between legislators trying to hand off to a governmental agency, which is what this legislation tried to do. And the agency isn't beholden to anybody. So we prefer to try to work with legislators who at least are responsive to voters so that the definition and the permissions and the regulations are all put in place by the legislature and not handed to a governmental agency that may or may not want to pick and choose winners and losers. Oh. Uh, I have two questions, one for you, Terry, and one probably for Kristen. So. I want to know why was pyrolysis not part of the uh, recycling method that was, why was it excluded? And then I think for Kristen, it's uh, sort of like the question that was asked about tin cans. I end up with a lot of glass jars, and I very painstakingly have been removing all the labels from them, and some of those labels are, they take a lot of time. I soak them with water and baking soda, I soak them with water and vinegar, and um, you still have to spend a whole lot of time. Then you use your goo gone in order to get rid of all the glue. So I, I wanna know, like, do you have to take the labels off from the glass as well? But also this question about pyrolysis, please. So my understanding, and I'll say right, I don't have a complete understanding of what was happening in the 1980s to understand why the legislators were so against pyrolysis, distillation, and some of the other terms that are descriptors of this method, although I think it had to do with being generally against the petroleum industry and more processing being done in California. But I don't know the answer for sure, Denise. And I think that it'll be important as we try to make sure that it becomes acceptable to go back and understand the root reason for the original decisions and then try to understand what the sentiments are in communities that right now are very anti-petroleum and see if there's a way to get them to understand that pyrolysis may be a solution, not a problem. And I'll hand this off to Kristen. Sounds like you're going to a lot of work to try to recycle, so <laughs> we definitely appreciate that. Um, I want to look into your question because my, my first easy answer is yes, it should be removed, but at the point that you're using products to remove them and soaking them and going to the extra mile, at what point is it worse to recycle because you're using so much water and chemicals to try to remove the glue, et cetera. So I want to look into that a little bit for you. Um, just to give everyone a little bit more background on the city and what we do and how your recyclables are treated, because it might be helpful for the discussion. Um, th 
here in Claremont, we do all of our collection with our own in-house crews. So you've seen our trucks, you probably know your driver. Um, all of that's done internally by the city. And we contract with local facilities to actually do the recyclable processing. So currently, we're under contract with a waste management facility in the city of Azusa. All of the material is taken there, and they have the mechanical recycling that Terry was alluding to with all of the conveyor belts and the pickers and everything goes through extremely quickly. So we work very closely with that facility and as the changes have come about with China and National Sword, we've been trying to update our marketing. We very much like Terry heard from a recycling facility within the last 10 years, I think you said, used to say, if in doubt, just throw it in the blue container and the recycling facility will sort it because that's how uh, much capacity there was when China was accepting all of the material. That just in the last two years has done a full 180 and is no longer the case. So very much so now we're trying to reach out to the community to do more education about what is and isn't recyclable. Plastics probably being one of the biggest areas of confusion. And even some of the information we've received from waste management is inconsistent because from one facility to another, sometimes they don't have markets. Or maybe something is technically recyclable, but they don't have a big enough market for the material, and therefore their sorting equipment isn't um, set up to sort it. And that's the case with, let me see, I think um, resin codes four and five. Technically, they're recyclable, but it makes up a small portion of the waste stream, so the facility that we're working with really isn't, sort, isn't sorting it at this point, and are really focused more on resin codes one and two. So I'd like to look into your issue a little bit more, just because it sounds like you're going to a lot of work. But um, certainly, if you contact the city, if we don't have the answer, we'll go back to the facility we work with, talk to their recycling managers who are um, working with the end buyers and have really a pulse on what's going on in the market right now because it's changing so quickly and we'll try to get you as up to date of information as possible. I don't like <laughs> Thanks. I'm not sure who was up next, but we'll. Thank you. Kristen, does the city have an updated list that we can get a copy of and post on our refrigerators to guide us in? No problem. Um, we do. The Dirty Dozen flyer that Terry had up is something we've been distributing at some of our city events. You may have seen that at Earth Day. And we're working on getting more, mater more materials out to the public and on our website. So we're working on that now and getting it updated. The Dirty Dozen flyers, I think that they do have them available at City Hall right now. And like I said, we're working on getting some updated flyers. We had a flyer that was just distributed at Earth Day back in April, and it's already out of date. And there's something on there that they say is allowable that isn't. So <laughs> we're, we're trying to get our marketing materials updated as fast as the markets are changing, which is a challenge. I'm interested to know <clears throat> why isn't waste to energy more widely adopted? What are the obstacles? What are the downsides to it? Does it produce greenhouse gases and so on? The Ellen MacArthur Foundation considers the waste to energy to not be acceptable because they want everything to stay in circular flow. Um, in Europe, waste to energy is very common. In the United States, it's less common because prior to technology that's more advanced, it really did produce emissions. And it's very capital intensive. So in order to create a facility that's really not going to cause greenhouse gas release, you need to have enough capital investment to control those emissions. But it's a very efficient, when you think about um, pumping oil out of the ground and sending it to an electrical generating plant, why not have it pass a couple of times through a plastic package before it goes to generate electricity? Seems pretty reasonable to me, but there are fears, some legitimate, some from the past, that it's not clean and it's going to cause more emissions. I think it's another area like pyrolysis where we probably need to rethink our attitude. Did that, was there another question? That, okay. 
I was wondering, with all this plastic that's collected in the ocean, are there any effective methods that are underway to try to clean that up? So I had the good fortune of being on a sailboat that had just come back from doing one of those expeditions trying to pick up plastic. And as condensed as it looks on these um, charts, it really isn't. It's, you have to be dragging some nets behind a, a ship for quite a while to pick up anything significant. So from a sustainability perspective, it's a lot more efficient to control the waste at the rivers and, on, and do coastal cleanup than it is to try to collect the material in the ocean. And some of the people I've been talking with about the ocean plastic is that probably, eventually it'll all settle to the bottom most of it, or it'll be broken down into microplastics. But the view is that probably hundreds of years from now, you'll do core samples, and there will be this like layer of plastic from the 20, <laughs> or, you know, the years that we were not controlling waste, but that eventually it'll be buried and won't be rising to the surface. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first is, um, pyrolysis, is that a polluting or non-polluting process? Um, and has that changed since it was outlawed? Is it different today than it was then? And then I want to ask Christine. Yeah. Honestly, I'm not a chemist and I don't know the answer. My understanding is that given the um, strict regulations that are in place now in, in California, for instance, that you can produce, you could do pyrolysis without it being polluting. Um, but that's an assumption, so I would have to double. Ch I would have to check on that to give you an answer on that. I brought this with me because my the box I bought it in says it's recyclable, but um, not recyclable in all communities. So I'm asking: Is this are these recyclable in Claremont, or do, what? Um, <laughs> Yeah, K, K pod or whatever they're called, K cup pod. <laughs> um, this goes back to something that Terry discussed during the um, presentation. Because the facility that we work with uses mechanical recycling, they have conveyor belts and grates, and small items like this fall through. So for that reason, not because of the makeup so much, but because of the process that they go through to be efficient, it's not recyclable at the facility that we work with. Give you a copy. Can you maybe? Maybe in the newsletters, the, the Claremont newsletters, maybe there could be something on recycling on just about every one, something. In the, um, I also am curious about the answer to the um, removing the label on the glass, because it is, you, a, a can has, is real, the label is loose except at one place, and you just peel it off pretty easily. The glass, it is, it is really, <laughs> it's a job. <laughs> I'm going to research the glass issue, um, but we are definitely trying to increase our outreach because so much has changed in the recycling world and the community is very interested in making sure that they're recycling right and we're getting a lot of questions. So we are um, stepping up our recycling outreach. Earth Day had a very high recycling focus this year. Um, we had a recycling booth specifically to talk about recycling issues and answer questions at National Night Out, if any of you had an opportunity to go to that. So we're going to try to have more booths at city events where we can distribute information, talk directly with residents. Um, we have had a recycling tip of the week in the city manager's weekly update um, most often. So if you subscribe to the electronic newsletter that the city manager releases every Thursday. We're trying to put a recycling tip of the week or a sustainability related item in that. And I think the glass jars with the paper and how to remove them, um, if that's the case, that'll probably be an upcoming tip, I'm thinking, since there's a lot of questions about that. Um, but certainly the city letter as well that gets mailed to homes, we're trying to have more of a recycling focus and have that be a consistent item that we're bringing forward so the community is thinking about it and getting their questions answered.
Thank you, that was very informative. Um, my question's actually for Kristen also. Um, clamshells, can we recycle them if we take the lid off? Okay. Um, and water bottles, how dry do they have to be before you put that cap on? And I'd also heard the caps have to go in the bottles so that they don't fall through the grid as well. Yes, we do ask that um, caps be on the bottles. As far as how dry, um... I'll tell you. I'll tell you that in the PET recycling process, there's a wash step, so it gets washed in a caustic bath, so it doesn't have to be super dry. It's going to be ground up and washed anyway. Mm -hmm. That's not true of all plastics, but PET, it's, it gets washed. When we say clean and dry, I think we're thinking more of the peanut butter jars and spaghetti sauce jars and things of that nature. And especially with, with glass items, if you throw your spaghetti, gas, spaghetti sauce jar in the recycling and it's in the truck with all of the other recyclables, there's a good chance that jar is going to break and your spaghetti sauce is going to get on your neighbor's junk mail that they've recycled diligently. And now that junk mail is no longer recyclable. Because everything is commingled, it's really important just to make sure that the, the food waste is removed. So that's just something to think about. But a few drops in your water bottle I don't think it would be a problem. I was the city of Claremont's representative to Sanitation District 21, which includes um, the land use that was, is down near the corner of the 605 and the 60. And um, I just have a couple of comments. There used to be a pyrolytic waste energy plant over there, a little um, west of that area that we went and visited, and it got shut down because of air quality issues. Scrubbers were not um, technologically advanced. The neighbors did not like the trucks coming in to deliver the goods, and um, it generally, it, I believe it closed down probably 10 years ago or something like that. The city of San Francisco takes all of its compostables, green waste and their little green biodegradable bags full of um, compost that are put into the green bins and they ship it, ship it, truck it up to someplace near Davis and burn it for fuel uh, as, and use it as fuel for energy. And so I think the company's called Recology and my daughters live there so I've checked it all out and thought, well, that's interesting, but transportation costs, and Davis is a little more in the rural area, that means that if they were doing it here, they'd probably schlep it through the Inland Empire and go out to um, a desert area in order to put flames to it. And the last comment is, we heard, this is way back then, the reason you didn't have to take glass or labels off as glass is because what they did when they were recycling glass was crush it and then heat it so hot that the paper labels just disappeared. But I don't know whether that's true anymore. And that's, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, Terry, I had a question. Um, you read yeah, online and in the news how we ourselves are ingesting like the equivalent of a credit card a week of plastic. How do we avoid getting that plastic into our bodies? Well, the last credit card I ate, I ate didn't taste very good. Um, I don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, I think we need to understand where the source of it is. Is it fish? Is it in our water? Is it elsewhere, and is it going to do harm? I mean, it sounds terrible. I don't like the idea that I would be eating a credit card worth of plastic, but it depends on the plastic type, and in many respects, it's pretty inert. So maybe it's just like more cellulose or more fiber. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is about bioplastics and the role that they may or could play in moving away from petroleum eventually, anyway. Yeah, so bioplastics are really interesting. So bioplastics are really plastics that are made from plants, 
generally, so they're grown, and the best bioplastics are made from parts of plants that are not the edible part, so the part that would normally be either plowed into the ground or ground up or composted could then be used to produce plastics. And one of the best examples is a company in Brazil called Brasichem that uses sugarcane to produce one of the two elements of PET. And that's the reason that you see with some of the um, Coca-Cola or Nestle or some of the other companies that talk about a plant bottle or they talk about a bio-based bottle, their PET is in part coming from biologically based materials. And the, the really good thing about some of these is they're exactly the same as the petroleum material. And so whether the source is bio-based, sugarcane, or the source is natural gas, they can all go into the same recycling system. They can all go into the same circular economy for plastics. The calculus with bioplastics is just the same as we just discussed. Is it, is it worth using the water to clean the product to make it recyclable? Is it worth using land to grow something that's going to produce plastics when we have a big reserve of resources that could be recycled in our landfill or if we create a circular economy. But if it comes from a plant that's going to be used for food anyway and this is a, a secondary part of it, then that's the ultimate. Or if it's being grown in a part of the earth where you really can't grow much of anything else and it's a very, say, drought-tolerant, fast-growing plant that is, is going to really just sequester carbon, then it might be a good solution. And there are definitely companies working on a variety of bioplastics. The challenge right now is cost. With petroleum being so prevalent right now and the price being so low, virgin materials from petroleum-based sources tend to be much more um, cost-effective when purchasing people are making choices of starting material. Um, thank you for your um, full disclosure when you started, too, about telling, you know, the industry that you do work in, um, um, kind of knocking the legislature, knocking the legislature for banning the distillation and the pyrolysis when a couple people have asked you about the reasons behind that, not being able to answer it. I just might take a different tone next time you give the talk, but you talked about changing the economics of the plastic. In paint now, paint stores are required to take back paint for recycling, and we all pay a premium for recycling our sodas, aluminum, and glass um, at the grocery store. Has, is anybody exploring making people pay the actual cost of keeping the plastic where it's being sold, where it's being used, so that we're paying the real cost of it as opposed to spreading that cost off to people in other parts of the world who can't afford it. So what you're talking about is known as extended producer responsibility. And it's very common in Europe and it's, high, it's very much used in Canada. And the people that produce the materials um, are not responsible for the fee but the brand owners that choose to use those materials pay an extra fee, in Canada in particular. Each province has its own fee depending on the costs associated with recycling that particular material. So if, for instance, PET is less expensive to recycle, the fee is lower. If it's a different plastic that's hard, harder to recycle, then the fee is higher. And Canada has been struggling with lack of harmonization in all of their provinces, and they're in the process of harmonizing so that eventually there'll be similar fees throughout all of Canada. Um, the bill that I talked about in California has an extended producer responsibility um, component. There are bills in Vermont, Massachusetts, and Maine that also are focused on extended producer responsibility with the concept being that those who produce the materials should be responsible for paying for recycling as opposed to having that fall on the shoulders of the taxpayer. Is that what you meant? Okay. And thank you for your comment about I didn't intend to be negative about the legislation on pyrolysis other than to say we shouldn't be basing today's decisions on statutes that have been in place since the 1980s when technology has changed.
Thank you. One last question. Oh, Sally. Thank you. I've learned a whole lot tonight, and I, I'm still, I know I need to learn a lot more, but I brought some specific examples that I wanted to ask about because I don't know if I can recycle them. <laughs> It's a, one of the gelato containers. So what we've heard from the recycling facility that we work with, if it has a one or a two on it, it's recyclable. Um, four and five, technically recyclable, but it makes up such a small portion of the waste stream that they're not really set up to sort it effectively. And three, six, and seven, they don't want, there's no market. So that's just kind of a guide that you can use. And we'll put that out in the city manager's weekly update as well, maybe through the city letter that gets mailed out to homes so that information is available to the public. And the cap should be, well, I would imagine so. I would imagine it's the same as with a water bottle. Yeah, it depends on what the material is. This is a one. Is a different material. Oh, mm -hmm. good. So if good point. The cap is different than take off the cap. Yeah, the cap the is, cap is a, two. a two. So they'd have to be. <laughs> and yes, actually, milk cartons is what changed on the flyer that we have, we're distributing at Earth Day. Um, it was on the yes list, and recently I've been told it's on the no list, and I don't know the reasoning for that, but we'll do some outreach about that. The, the cap? It's confusing, I know. And what is this? Let's see. This looks like it has a one on it. So a one, again, is acceptable. So ones and twos are, are pretty broadly safe, if that helps. And please do feel free to call, contact our office, because the more we know what people have questions about, that helps us to really tailor our marketing to the community. So please do call the community services office and ask us your questions. If we don't know, we'll research it for you. And we'll assume that others in the community have the same question, and we can do more outreach. So we appreciate it. Okay, we're going to wrap up. Um, Freeman? <laughs> are, are you going to wrap up? I have to point something out. Okay. I want you to all see that this slide is number 47, and that has a very special meaning. About 60 years ago, when we had some summer research students here, they were sitting the ground and just shooting the breeze, and they said, whatever number you might come up with, you'll find all sorts of connections. They chose 47. Uh, the freeway entrance to Claremont is now 47. <laughs> all of the faculty, everybody who has a link on the computer has a, uh, their initials and then 04747 to sign in. And I just wanted to point out that huge coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, that. Thank you all for coming. It's been wonderful hearing from you, and thank you, Sarah.